Good afternoon and good morning to those of you who are in the middle part and the western parts of the country. Welcome everyone. We are pleased that you're joining us today as we start the first of a three-part series, webinar series that is, looking at turnover at health center organizations. We know that things are especially hectic right now and we appreciate the time, out of, taking the time out of your schedules to join us. I'm Suzanne Spear. I'm the Director of Workforce Development here at ACU, and we are just really pleased that you're joining us today. Before we get started, a little bit about ACU. We are a national membership organization founded over 20 years ago as a National Health Service Corps alumni organization. And we've changed a bit over the years, but we remain committed to the health center workforce. And we're really focused on two goals, and that's access to care and also clinician support. Recruitment and retention of a transdisciplinary team is the road to achieving those goals. We have many programs, and you can check those out on our website, which is clinicians.org. But today I am here, and we are all here, because of our national cooperative agreement, which is the STAR Center. And ACU holds that national cooperative agreement through HRSA's Bureau, Pri Bureau of Primary Healthcare. And our NCA, again, is the STAR Center. And that stands for Solutions, Training, and Assistance for Recruitment and Retention. And just as our name indicates, the STAR Center is really your one-stop shop for free tools and resources for the recruitment and retention of a health center workforce. You can go to our website at chcworkforce.org to take a look at all of our tools, resources, online courses, and more. And again, when you go there, everything that you see is free and available to everyone that is there. Just a few webinar housekeeping items here before we get started today. First, we are recording this session. It will be emailed to you after this session, and it will also be publicly available on our website, as well as you will be um, receiving the recording as well as the slide deck from our session. Second of all, ask questions. We welcome any and all questions you may have. We will have a Q&A time at the end of our session, but feel free to ask them in the chat box as you think of them during the presentation. Lastly, please complete our brief evaluation at the end of the session. Your feedback is really important to us, and we use that to inform and improve our future sessions. As I mentioned, we would love for you to ask questions. You can either use the chat or questions box. And if you're going to use the chat box, you can direct all of your questions or comments to everyone. And you can do that by selecting all panelists and attendees. Or if you'd rather just keep your questions to the panelists, you can select uh, panelists on the chat box there. If you're having any connection issues or anything else related to um, your technical questions or issues, feel free to email Mariah Blake at mblake at clinicians.org and she will get you pointed in the right direction. So as I mentioned, this is the first of a three-part webinar series and we really, with that three-part series, we have some goals set out for this all of these three webinars. So first of all, we really want for you to understand the impact of turnover at your organization and at organizations nationally. That's really what we're going to be unpacking today. For the rest of the series, we're also going to be learning how to identify organizational risk factors contributing to turnover and what folks you know, why are folks leaving your organization and what you can do to really reduce that turnover, and that's going to be that last part, or reducing turnover, that's going to be unpacked in the last webinar that we go through. And our hope is that by the end of the series, you'll really have some tools in your toolbox to take a look at turnover globally at your organization, and then what you can do to combat it 
as you move forward. And we know that things are changing rapidly, but we really think that by the end of the series, you can get an idea of how to, to really take a look at turnover as it relates to you know, now and also in the future as we come back through this crisis. We are really thrilled to have some great presenters here with us today. In addition to myself, Dr. Tori Mack is going to be speaking to us, and she is the Deputy Associate Administrator for the Bureau of Health Workforce. And she will be taking us through and talking about the issue of turnover, and specifically burnout, and the steps that HRSA is taking to combat the issue at health centers. Then we will have Alexia Eslan, and she is the senior consultant at John Snow Incorporated, speaking about turnover and its impact on providers and organizations overall. Finally, I will be speaking about the financial implications of turnover and showcasing one of the Star Center tools available to help you assess the true cost of turnover at your organization. And before I turn, over, turn it over to Dr. Mack, rather, I am going to be asking you a poll question. So Mariah is going to launch our poll question, and it is going to be available there on your screen. So in the past, how much has your organization focused on retention or turnover at your organization? So, so not really at all. We haven't really thought about turnover too much. We've really just been sort of focusing on recruitment at our organization? Have you be focused on it from time to time? It's been something that's kind of come and go, but you haven't really spent a lot of effort on it. Or are you deeply focused and invested in combating turnover at your organization? So take a minute and you know, choose one of those. There's no wrong answer, but it just gives us a good idea of the background of the organizations at, um, that are on this webinar. So if you guys wouldn't mind just putting that in there, just clicking the box and hitting, um, hitting that button, that would be great. And we'll leave it open for about one, maybe about 10, 15 more seconds, and then we'll keep going there. All right. So it looks pretty much like I thought it might. So the majority of you, 67% of you that answered the poll, really have focused on it from time to time, but haven't been deeply focused on turnover. So thank you guys so much for sharing that. And we will keep that in mind as we go throughout um, this one and also this series. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mack, who, again, is the Deputy Associate Associate Administrator for the Bureau of Health Workforce um, there at HRSA. So, Dr. Mack, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And hello and good afternoon to everyone. As Suzanne mentioned, I am the Deputy for the Bureau of Health Workforce at HRSA. I just want to briefly talk about our mission, which is to improve health of underserved and vulnerable populations by strengthening the health workforce and connecting skilled professionals to communities in need. So I've been with the Bureau a little over a year now, and I've really honed in on that strengthening of the workforce piece. And so that's what I really want to talk about today when I want to go through some, some slides about workforce well-being and burnout and how that's related to turnover and really highlighting some key ways that we can combat this issue. And so what I'm going to go through today is first I want to talk about healthcare's triple aim, which is really about health system performance. And in talking about this, I'm really just honing in on where that one key area where it, it does miss the mark and where we could really broaden that to the quadruple aim. I want to talk about COVID-19's impact on clinician well-being, which is, of course, very timely. I want to talk about clinician burnout next and why there are some high stakes for inaction. And then how we can promote workforce well-being from a system standpoint, and what are those targeted interventions that can help in almost every setting and program. So first, the triple aim. 
Again, the triple aim is meant to optimize health system performance. And so the goal is improving the overall health of the population by improving patient outcomes and experience and reducing costs. And that's from IHI. So essentially it's delivering the right care for the right price at the right time. But really it's very powerful, but really there's just one very important piece that was missing from this and that's the healthcare providers themselves. So moving on, when you add that one key insight to that enhancing provider well-being, it really expands it to the quadruple aim. So just the thought is that improving the work life of healthcare clinicians and staff has to be achieved in order to successfully improve population health. We cannot improve healthcare without the healthcare workforce, in other words. This relationship between the quality of care and clinician wellness is really hitting us particularly hard right now when we think about the impact of COVID-19 both, acute, both acutely and how it's gonna impact this in the future. The COVID-19 stress on providers. So some of these key stressors are, you know, a lot of it's early to tell, but there have been some studies that are coming out of both China and Italy that are talking about those emotional and psychological tolls of those who are fighting who are fighting COVID-19. And some of those early reports are highlighting these key stressors, so prolonged uncertainty, whether it be about the magnitude of the disease or the duration, how long it's gonna last, what are those effects? You may see every day there's new literature coming about about how these effects are really um, testizing. There's concerns about preparedness. This could be at a personal and organizational level or really even in the public sector. There's some stress around the lack of needed supplies personal protective equipment, other equipment and tests, and also about potential threats. These healthcare providers are, are looking, you know, when they go into the hospital or to health centers, really risking their own health and then bringing back that contagion to their loved ones as well. Also worrying about their coworkers. And with these stressors, it really leads to an overall psychological effect on these providers. And what that's looking like um, currently is manifesting in depression, irritability, avoidance, distress, insomnia, anxiety. And I really wanted to talk about this because this is an acute stress that's being added on to a chronic problem, right? So these are adding on and compiling to a workforce that's already facing the impacts of burnout. And next I wanna highlight those impacts of burnout. So what is burnout? There are several different definitions, but really it's that chronic workplace stress this, what I'm showing right now is actually from the World Health Organization. And it looks at three components or three dimensions. And so the first one is that feeling of exhaustion or energy depletion, emotional exhaustion, exhaustion being overextended. The next piece is cynicism, which is also called depersonalization. That's how the National Academies categorizes that. And that's just that increased mental distance from your job, feeling of negativism, and really just feeling impersonal towards patients, um, really that mental distance. And the third dimension is inefficacy. And that's really just related to having a low sense of personal accomplishment. Burnout, I'd like to highlight again, it is an occupational phenomenon, and though it may impact at the workforce level, its roots definitely lie within the work setting. So what is the scope of the problem? What is it looking like right now? And, and I have this slide on here just to highlight how broad of an issue this is. So on average, approximately 50% of physicians, nurses, medical students, residents are experiencing symptoms of burnout. It can range up to as high as 60% for med students and residents. Physicians are also experiencing burnout at twice the rate of American workers. So I'm just highlighting this is burnout is not just specific to the healthcare workforce, but certainly has um, a higher, greater impact on the workforce. Some studies have shown that burnout has increased 9% among physicians, for instance, while it's remaining stable for other US workers. And then our frontline providers are particularly impacted. They're caring for our sickest, whether they be family medicine, doctor, general internal medicine, emergency medicine, they're really experiencing the highest rates of burnout. Additionally, when we looked at the impact on the healthcare system, what we see is that there are two times the number of unsafe or suboptimal care. So physicians with burnout are twice as likely to be involved in patient safety incidents. They're twice as likely to deliver suboptimal care to patients due to low professionalism. And they're three times more likely to receive low satisfaction ratings from patients. So 
the last boat, the last circle here is about the cost. And so this is a conservative estimate of $4.6 billion in costs, but really there's estimates that are high as 6.3 billion. The study found that about, if you look at average, the annual burnout cost per position, for instance, was $7,600. And these costs can, can really be um, attributed to increased absenteeism, reduced productivity, increased medical errors and safety lapses, more, more malpractice claims, and high rates, of course, of turnover. So clearly, again, just highlighting that the triple aim will not be accomplished without addressing the clinician well-being. So what are the burnout impacts on turnover? There's been several cross-sectional studies that show that positions had with burnout it itself is independently associated with job dissatisfaction and intent to leave. When we look at nurses, for instance, it's not only that current job, but something that's particularly of interest to us, the Bureau of Health Workforce, is that they're actually leaving the health workforce overall. There's certainly financial implications um, with turnover and with um, RN specifically. 1.3 times their salary is the cost that's attributed to, to a turnover. Additionally, when we look at positions, that cost can rise to as much as 500,000 per, per position, but depending on specialty, that can even be up to a million dollars. And these costs are attributed to recruitment, training, and lost productivity as well. Of course, this is not taking into account the cost beyond the financial, such as patient satisfaction, as I was mentioning, and the experience for other colleagues, as well as public perception of a health center as well. And I'd like to highlight here also that turnover is going to impact community health centers and those who serve the underserved even at higher rates, and that's been shown in literature as well. So the good news is there are several protective elements and how you can counter burnout. The, you know, some of them are tangible and some are intangible, but these are all some protective elements that we can actually use. On the following slide, I'll talk about how you can have some systems-wide assessments and improvements. And so in 2019, the National Academies put out a set of for eliminating burnout and enhancing professional well-being, and it highlighted these particular items that need to be addressed. So creating a meaning and purpose in work, having a positive work and learning environment, the alignment of values with the expectations, including on the job, having job control, flexibility, and autonomy, really reducing those administrative burdens. And this is key, whether it be laws, regulations, policies, standards, healthcare policies, health center policies, anything that sort of impedes and provides an extra burden on top of other stress. It's been really shown that any type of efforts to combat this are very, very helpful optimize workflows and the use of technology in a meaningful way, interdisciplinary team collaboration, which is something else that we really focus on at the Bureau of Health Workforce has really been shown to counter burnout, and then having that supportive and effective leadership as well. So you can roll these up into some strategies to reduce burnout and what that looks like. Again, highlighting that this is a systems issue. You're not going to be able to um, solve this just focusing on one on one clinician at a time. And I just want to highlight that because uh, a lot of in the early stages when folks were talking about burnout and talking about well-being, a lot of it was about the provider counteracting uh, characteristics or personalities that may be unique to a provider that can cause some of these issues. But really, counteracting burnout cannot rest solely in the hands of a provider. It's really that system issue. And so what I've taken here are some strategies, and this is from a 2017 article in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. This is by uh, Dr. Tate Shanafelt, who um, works at Stanford and has done a lot of work in the area of clinician wellness and well-being. And first, it's acknowledging and assessing the problem. This is really important because organizations, you know, measure what they believe is critical to achieving their mission. I am a neonatology physician, um, currently not practicing, but I just recall how many sort of safety measurements we would do throughout the day in terms of how we were providing care and just how that was ingrained in us in terms of it being very, very important. In the same way, assessing and acknowledging staff well-being regularly can really add to the impact and showing that the organization truly cares about this issue. Harnessing the power of leadership. And so part of that is actually selecting the right leaders. Um, and also, what are those leadership positions? 
uh, do you have a chief of well-being or someone who's particularly over wellness or a wellness officer? Developing and preparing these individuals for these roles and really allowing them to regularly assess that leader's performance also to show that this is an important issue as well. The next one is developing and implementing targeted work unit interventions. And this is again, using the data, using what you find in that assessment to really drive what those targeted interventions are gonna be. Cultivating community at work is very important. That includes connection with colleagues, nurturing peer support, and this is in formal and informal ways, but really bringing staff together to talk and share ideas and to build and foster those relationships. The next one is using rewards and incentives wisely. And this is also important to be conscious of how you are using these carrots as rewards. Aligning values and strengthening culture. So again, creating that shared value to affirm. This really speaks to wanting to feel like you are effective in your job, right? How do we align those values and, and honestly seek some honest feedback about how your staff are about evaluating the organization and how you're living out those values as well. Promoting flexibility and work-life integration is also very important. There's multiple ways to do this, and a lot of the most successful ones are really driven by the staff to have them come up with what are those typical barriers and how can they be overcome, whether it be some flexible start times, reduction of hours, and so how do we do that but still know that we need to meet the organization's needs. Providing resources to promote resilience are important. Again, I just would highlight that these can't be done in a in a silo, so they're best received when they're part of an overall effort to address the systemic and environmental issues, or else you risk sending that message that the individuals themselves are the problem. And then lastly, facilitating funding that science and research. And this could just really be, even if it's just developing at the organizational level, some metrics or how you're going to assess how you're doing. What are these benchmarks? Are there national benchmarks you can use or you wanna create your own to be able to, to move the needle there and implementing those practice analytics as well. This here is wanted to talk about um, the Bureau of Health Workforce, sort of how we're thinking about provider wellness. We we're continually looking for ways in which we can support provider wellness, whether it's during the education phase of our practitioners, training or service, our, our efforts are across that whole continuum. Again, focusing on rural and underserved areas and communities, which we know are hardest hit, both the patients and the providers themselves. For that end, we've incorporated a number of strategies into our programs to really foster well-being and to help the providers counteract those factors. They range from the self-care efforts I was talking about in terms of enhancing the support for providers, really building those strong relationships with peers and colleagues, having many of our grantees with pre and post program assessments to really help gauge the results of our efforts as well. All of these we work through and in the project echo there at the bottom also is how we can better use telehealth, um, telementoring to be able to do that as well. And I won't belabor this one as I know there are folks on the line who, who can speak to this in, um, in great detail, but we're also taking steps at HRSA among other things, our Bureau of Primary Health Care, which is our sister bureau, a sister bureau to the Bureau of Health Workforce, has recently launched an initiative to study that question. And we really won't see the results for a couple, um, for a while, but we really expect this to be quite enlightening. And this is to study the factors that are affecting provider well-being, which ones are gonna rise to the top among our health center workforce, and what we can do about it. And I also just want to highlight this as a resource, and I'm happy to provide other resources as they're helpful for you all, including any that I've talked about today. But a year ago, HRSA issued a special edition of the Primary Healthcare Digest, which was focused on the issues of workforce engagement and well-being, has a plethora, it's really rich in resources of all types on these issues, and it can really help launch a wellness program. It can help find you some materials to expand any program that you have get a chance, I would encourage you all to take a look because, of course, a healthy, engaged health center workforce is one of our highest priorities as well. And just to close out, just, you know, end where we began here with the quadruple aim, I did want to just leave this one quote that I found moving from that Mayo Clinic proceedings I read. That is, any healthcare organization that recognized it had a system issue that threatened quality of care, eroded patient satisfaction, and limited access to care would rapidly mobilize organizational resources to address that problem. Burnout, as the author emphasized, is precisely such a system issue. And I just highlight even more so now in the face of this acute on top of chronic that we're seeing right now from, from COVID, 
There are high stakes for inaction, but there are targeted interventions that can really help in almost every setting and program. And it's really something that we need to embrace in order to recruit and retain staff and build a healthier population overall. So thank you all. Wonderful, Dr. Mack, thank you so much for being with us today. And um, we really are just honored that you would take some time out of your busy schedule to share with us about turnover and burnout and what, um, you know, what the Bureau of Health Workforce is doing to combat, um, to combat turnover and burnout there. So sorry, we're having some technical difficulties <laughs> with the screen here. There we go. Um, and um, we're going to, I'm going to hand it over in just a minute to Alexia, and she is going to talk to us really about um, national overview of really what's going on with turnover nationally and how it affects both individuals as well as organizations uh, themselves. So um, again, thank you to Dr. Mack. We will have a time for question and answer at the end. Um, but until then, we'll uh, keep going with the rest of our program. So I'm gonna give you control over the screen, Alexia, and then you can take it away. Wonderful, thank you so much, Suzanne, and thank you, Dr. Mack, for that overview. Um, before I dive into uh, the content, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview um, of JSI. So I'm, uh, I'm a senior consultant at JSI. I've been at the organization for over 12 years, really focusing a lot of my work working with uh, safety net providers and the health systems that they work in and uh, looking at how those can be improved and how they can uh, form strong partnerships. Uh, JSI, for those of you that are not familiar with our organization, um, has been around for over 40 years. We're a consulting organization, and we're deeply committed to improving the health of individuals and communities, both in the United States as well as across the globe. Uh, we work across a full range of public and community health areas, uh, strengthening health systems to improve services, and ultimately what's most important in improving individual and community health. Um, so with that intro, uh, let me jump into uh, the provider retention and the national overview. I thought I would start off with a few statistics, and this is building on what Dr. Mack had shared. Um, I know um, she spoke quite a bit about the burnout piece, which is a very important factor of um, retention. Um, so. According, we have a statistic here, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, the demand for physicians is growing at 13%. Uh, so competing for and retaining talented physicians will only become more of a challenge. It is important that the healthcare organizations take a deep dive into looking at physician retention, why physicians leave, and interventions that could prevent staff from seeking other employment. Um, in addition, uh, growing aging population, as well as with pandemics like COVID-19, these demands are only exasperated. Um, there is not too much research on uh, retention, and that's why it's, uh, this is one of the reasons why HRSA, ACU, and their partners are focusing on this important issue. Um, data from 2012 from the SESHCA search in the American Medical Group Association Physician Retention Survey show that the average physician turnover rate um, is was 6.8%, and that was up from 6% in 2011. And it's even higher for advanced practice clinicians such as uh, physician assistants. The survey also shows the uh, persistence of high turnover in the first years uh, with a practice, um, which seems to indicate that many physicians and hiring organizations may lack an accurate assessment of culture, career motivations, and satisfaction with the location on the part of um, both the provider and maybe their significant other. Um, there's many other reasons that also affect turnover. And the turnover rate uh, drops below the yearly average after year five. Um, so that's a key factor there as well. 
we heard about burnout and lack of engagement from Dr. Mack and how those are highly correlated to lower retention rates. And especially primary care physicians have among the highest rates of burnout. Um, organizations must create an env environment that actively engages employees. Um, if not, some will leave and maybe even some might leave the, the practice altogether. So there's a stat that shows that dissatisfied physicians are two to three times more likely to leave practice. So definitely an important issue at both uh, at the national level. Um, another very important um, reason to focus on this is cost. Um, this here is um, some numbers from the Association for Advancing Physician and Provider Recruitment, and they estimate that when looking at all these various factors for a physician vacancy for a 12-month period, including the recruitment and startup costs for a new physician, the cost to the organization could be up to $1.2 million. Um, so you can see the breakdown here on the slide. Um, this is an average. Uh, later, Suzanne will be talking about the financial assessment tool that ACU created, which will assist you in determining what these costs might be specifically for your health center. So in our next webinar in this series, we are gonna be diving into a lot more detail around what affects retention. Uh, but I wanted to share with you a few uh, key factors. Um, so these are many of uh, the factors that affect retention. Uh, there was a survey that was conducted by the University of Massachusetts Medical School and the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers. They surveyed community health centers, primary care physicians, um, to really identify what are the factors that relate to preparedness, recruitment, and retention. And these were the top factors that are listed here, um, including working for an organization whose mission they believe in, with it's 89% uh, of respondents stating that that was a reason why they selected to work at a CHC, uh, serving an economically underserved population, as well as serving a culturally or linguistically um, minority population, wanting to serve in a specific geographic region, and uh, wanting to live near family. That's something that comes up quite a bit. Um, and we had 52% of respondents selecting this factor. Um, this survey was conducted in 2013, so these results are from 2013. Along these lines, lack of cultural fit and relocation to be closer to a family or for a partner's job relocation were the most prevalent reasons for turnover in a survey that was conducted by the Association for Advancing Physician and Provider Recruitment. And you can see those percentages in this slide. So this is just to give you a little um, snapshot at some of the things that are um, that influence why uh, physicians might select the community health center, as well as some of the um, components that affect retention. But again, as I said, we'll really dive into this a lot more in our next um, in our next webinar. So now let's take more of a look at the organizational level. Um, so what are some factors that affect uh, retention at that organizational level? As we talked about, there is a significant impact on cost of having a vacancy and recruiting a new provider, as well as strain placed on staff having to find locum tenants and replacement providers. Also, when a provider leaves, it puts a lot of strain on the remaining providers and staff to manage the panel of the departing provider and train new providers, as well as it could lead to patients leaving the practice or being dissatisfied with their care. And most importantly, losing a provider could have a strong impact on the quadruple aim that Dr. Mack talked about. So my next slide, uh, I'm gonna show, let me go back. These are the 10 building blocks of high-performing primary care that uh, Tom Bodenheimer identified in 2014. And all of these are related to helping achieve that quadruple aim. And I would like to go over just a few of these and talk about how provider um, turnover can affect um, 
all of them actually, but I'm going to be focusing on these four foundational blocks. Um, so providers are, are leaders in a practice and every time there's a change, um, it affects the buy-in of that provider to a specific model of care that has been established within the organization and their leadership with their team as well as many providers are involved in leadership at the organizational level. So when a provider leaves, it could leave a big gap in leadership at the organization. Quality improvement efforts will shift and might slow down because focus is changing to dealing with a vacancy. So um, I've seen that many times um, in my work that quality improvement efforts are started, then there's some kind of crisis such as a provider a vacancy, and then everything has to stop or be put on hold till that um, position is replaced. So it really can have a big impact on your quality improvement efforts. And panelman and provider patient uh, continuity obviously will greatly be affected. Um, there will be some patient dissatisfaction and with changing providers, um, as well as as we talked as I talked about in the previous slide, additional burden on the remaining providers and staff. Um, trying to reassign all the patients in the departing providers panel to new panels is very time consuming and burdensome on all those involved and I'm sure all of you uh, know how, how that is. Um, and obviously the team itself um, will have to shift and um, it could create a big impact on how the team is operating together. Um, even Define roles of your team. You might have to shift roles for the interim um, and make other changes that will impact um, both the team as well as all the processes that the team is working on, um, such as those other blocks, so population management, um, care coordination, all these other items that your team is working on might be affected by that provider departing. So all these changes will greatly affect all aspects of the quadruple aim, including the clinical outcomes, costs, patient engagement and satisfaction, as well as provider and staff satisfaction. So these are some of the reasons to um, focus on retention. And um, here is my contact information. You're welcome to uh, reach out to me directly if you have any questions, but um, also through ACU, through Suzanne. So I'll hand it over back to Suzanne. Great, thank you so much, much Alexia. I really appreciate you taking us through all of the things to think about, you know, when we're thinking about and trying to address turnover. It really is a multifaceted issue, and we really want to make sure that we're thinking about all those things when we're thinking about, okay, what can we do about turnover? How can we combat it? There's so many things to think about. So I really appreciate you sharing those with us, Alexia. My pleasure. Okay. So as we move along here, so we've gone through really a few things. So Dr. Mack talked, us, talked to us about, you know, the priority of turnover and burnout as a national and federal organization and the care and the thought that they're putting into it as we think about providers and the organizations and frankly, which and, and the, the patients in which we serve. And then Alexia obviously took us through the all of the implications of turnout. And I'm going to talk a little bit about data and the data relating to turnover and why it's important to have that data and to look at that data. And you'll notice a theme in all of the things that we do here at the Star Center. If this is your first foray into all of the things that we are doing here at the Star Center, you may not have seen this quote. And if you are familiar with what we do here at the Star Center, you this quote will be very familiar to you. So we always say that without data, you're just another person with an opinion. And we, it's really true. Data says a lot, and it really is more than just 
a fact, you know, they're, they're facts, but it's important to have those facts because as you're building your strategy, whether it be on turnover, whether it be your recruitment and retention strategy, data is important to collect with all of that. Because if you don't have the data, you are just another person at your, with an opinion. We are all about having a data-informed workforce strategy here at the Star Center. And as we talk about turnover, it's really as important as anything else. So keep that in mind as we go along and as, it's, and as I talk to you about the, one of the tools that I'm going to share that we have here at the Star Center. Sorry, my slides are not wanting to advance. So really we want to think about, as we think about turnover and trying to increase retention, reduce burnout, we really need to look at the numbers. We need to look at the data. So here are a couple things to think about when it comes to that data. So we need to get an idea of exactly how much turnover is costing an organization. And I know Alexia mentioned some numbers about, you know, 1.2 million. Well, that is globally really, you know, nationally sort of an average, and there are lots of different factors that can change as we go along into, as we think about retention, about offboarding and onboarding, and so that's just an average. So we really need to get an idea of exactly what it's costing us as an organization, um, turnover is costing us as an organization. We also need to think about that because we need to understand the value of contributing to our retention programs, right? So if we're gonna do something about turnover and to combat it, we're gonna to have to invest some time, some resources into our retention programs. We need to be able to go over to our leadership and give them the data that supports our needs and desires of implementing those retention programs. Because, you know, when Health or when health center leaders ask about those numbers, it's their job. It's their job to ba balance those finances. They need to know those numbers. And it's also, frankly, on the other side, it's hard to argue with the numbers, right? So if you're coming to them and saying, turnover, every time we lose a physician, it's costing us X amount of dollars. But we want to contribute Y amount of dollars to retention programs and see it's less. So if we, we we're, we're really contributing less uh, to a retention program, then it's going to cost us to lose the physician. So it really makes sense. Okay, so, you know, again, all of these things to think about as we are trying to figure out the value of retention programs and the cost of turnover, right? So how much does it cost to recruit? How much is our money, excuse me, is our organization losing on these workforce issues? That's another big one. And how can we better invest our money to retain that staff? As I mentioned, you know, when you talk about the cost of turnover, you also want to think about the value of retention programs. So you're really comparing the two. You know, how much is it costing to turnover and how much is it um, costing to retain? So really thinking, thinking about those really sort of as you compare the two and as you talk to your leadership and if you are leadership think about the value in your retention program versus how much uh, retention excuse me turnover is costing you in order to do that we have a tool that enables you to determine the cost of turnover at your organization it's known as our financial assessment tool. We also call it our financial impact tool in that how much is turnover impacting the finances of your organization. So it's going to give you the actual cost of provider turnover at your organization. We're gonna take a look at it in our, in our uh, subsequent slides here, but really overall, it's gonna take it and have you look at exactly how much turnover is costing at your organization. There are a lot of different factors and it, every organization is different. So it's really important that you take this and you take it and actually fill it out as your organization. And you know, taking those, those numbers that Alexia introduced, those are important to, to, start, to start at, but it's really great for you to be able to utilize this tool and determine exactly what the cost of losing a provider is costing you to organization because again then it's going to determine the value of your retention program this tool is focused on both not physician and non-physician providers it has tabs for each so you're able 
to go in and fill those out so you can determine what those costs are for each of those disciplines. And it's a downloadable Excel file. So it's, it's able, you're able to customize it completely to your organization. If there's some costs, that are not in there that are that you want to include with either you know uh, with any of these different different items you can ab absolutely put in, them in there and you can make it your own so again it's completely free and it's downloadable and so you can easily use it and customize it for your organization and this tool takes into account all of the costs of turnover Oftentimes, when we talk, of, when we think about turnover, we just think maybe about lost revenue or the cost of recruitment or, you know, name 10 things, right? But there's so many things that really you want to think about collectively as it, as it relates to turnover. Because if you don't think about them collectively and add them all up, you're really not getting your true cost of turnover. So you want to think about several things. You want to think about separation. How much does how much do we have to pay the physician or the other provider that we're losing vacation time? Is it that something that you that you do when someone separates from your organization? So all the unused vacation time that they had, you know, all of the different costs all the different staff time it takes to do, you know, whether it's, um, you know, uh, a, an exit interview, excuse me, I, I lost my train of thought there, couldn't think of that name. Um, I could, you know, the, the exit interview, what's the staff time relating to that? All of those separation costs, right? There are lots of things that are related to the actual separation of a provider at your organization. So you also want to think about all of the different recruitment costs. There are so many different things it, as it relates to your recruitment costs, right? So are you going to advertise for this position? Are you going to put it in a publication? Are you going to put it in a national, you know, online magazine? How are you going to recruit for, those, for that position? Again, staff time to recruit. That's no small feat. There are a lot of different things that or go into your staff time, your HR staff time, your C-suite staff time, all of those are recruitment costs in relation to turnover and, um, and recruiting your, uh, a, a replacement for that person at turnover. Onboarding, again, this is staff time. This is lab coats, this is business cards. These are, these are, those are any other equipment relating to bringing a new physician or a provider on board at your organization. All of those are costs associated with turnover. And finally, engagement. This is the ramp up period that you're bringing someone on, introducing them to their patient panel, helping them get ramped up from, let's just say, you know, small, you know, 10 patients a day to where they, they might be eventually when they're fully ready to go um, and fully engaged at your organization, um, you know, with, with whatever their full patient panel is. So all of these are costs as it relates to turnover. You might not have thought about it, but really, when we're talking about turnover and assessing the cost of our turnover and the value of our retention programs that we're going to be getting to later on in this series, you really want to think about all of those things. We can't stress enough how important it is to really look at all of those things because until you get an accurate picture of that, you can't go and say, hey, we want to spend this and we think it's a good value. If you have the, an idea of the cost of turnover, you'll be able to have a great case for the value of those retention programs and that you want to put into place. So this is a financial, this is our financial assessment tool. As I mentioned, it goes into all of those costs that, um, that I just described, all of those different myriad of things that we should be thinking about when it comes to our of uh, our turnover. And frankly, our turnover and also new hire and onboarding, right? So it's sort of that full life cycle of losing a, a provider to really ramping up and engaging a full provider. So what is the total 
and complete financial impact to our organization. And again, all of these things, as you can see here, it really is a great way. It gives line by line all of the different things that could be involved with it. Um, and obviously, we're not going to live demo it here today, but it's, it, you can play with it easily. There is also some, you can put in your own cost in the in that column it also has a nationally available cost uh, available there so you can you can put those in if you're you know just want to get an idea of where you know where your organization falls whether it's more or less whether your financial impact is more or less than some of the nationally available data um, but that would be a great place to start just to see Okay, exactly how much is it um, with all of these different things um, in there. And then you can add your own data in from your organization to either take it to leadership and say, hey, this is exactly how much losing a provider is costing us. Um, and then, you know, losing a provider and then onboarding a new one. And if you are leadership, it's a great way to open your eyes to the cost of it. And I know that we're in a definitely um, – we're in a much different space than we were even three months ago, and finances are more important than ever. So as we think about, you know, how do we retain, how do we retain those people that are on board? How can we either financially incentivize them or bring some more programs on board or wellness or what have you? Really thinking about all of those things as it relates to the the, the really unique time that we're in, it really is more important now than ever to take a look at what turnover is costing us. And, you know, we understand that that some turnover is just completely inevitable. You can't keep someone forever, um, you know, whether it be because they're moving away or they, you know, they just want to do something different with their life. You can't, can't control all of that. But as we think about the specific pressures that we're under right now, it's really important to get an idea of how much that turnover is costing you. So then you can provide, um, you know, provide your organization with that, you know, with that calling card, figuring out how much, you know, it, that's costing you so you can determine how much your, you know, the value of your retention program for your providers and frankly for all of your staff. I know we're, we're focusing on providers today, but you really want to think about this um, from a staff point of view as well. Okay. So we've covered a lot of ground today and talking about the systemic problems of turnover and burnout and really getting an idea of how all of those things affect your organization. And as we look forward to our next few sessions, we are going to, you know, go through, you know, you know, go through a bunch of different things and eventually figure out how we can reduce that turnover to your organization. And next week, we are going to be taking a look at sort of the middle block here. We're going to be really looking to identify and understand all of those different factors that contribute to turnover. We, uh, Dr. Mack talked about them, and also Alexia talked about them, and really trying to figure out exactly what things, why are people leaving your organization? Their burnout is a huge one, and I know that, um, that Dr. Max spent quite a bit of time talking about that today. And there are also some other things that, you know, that why people leave. These are things that we can do something about, and we want to really think about them and look at them globally to figure out in the third session that we spend together, you know, how can we reduce those things. So we're going to be talking our, our next time about really taking a look at the different types of factors that contribute to turnover. So then, in, again, in our, in our last session together, what we can do to really reduce that turnover. So our next session, as I mentioned, is on those operational factors contributing to turnover, and it is next week at 1 o'clock. Um, so it's going to be a May 20th, of, uh, of obviously, of this year, at 1 o'clock, and we're going to be examining that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over and just see if we have any questions or comments that have come in. I haven't had it open during this time, so I'm going to take a look. And obviously, these are going to be for anybody here. So do we have any questions? 
And again, if it's something that as we go along or if you think of afterwards, feel free to send us an email. And if it's not for, if the question is not directed at me, we can certainly direct those either to Dr. Mack or to Alexia um, as we go forward. So it doesn't look like there are any that have come in so far. But we will leave it open for just a few more minutes um, as we've got about six more minutes here during our hour together. And as we're doing that and as we're waiting for any questions that might you might have to come in, we will launch a poll here, um, a, little, uh, a little questionnaire um, to ask you about what we can do to um, evaluate our session. And as you're as we're waiting for any questions, feel free to, um, to fill that out. That would be super helpful. Well, it doesn't look like we have any questions that have come in either to the questions, the Q&A box, or the chat box. Um, but I do want to, again, thank our speakers for today's session. We are truly honored to have you a part of this. Dr. Mack and um, Alexia Eslan there, um, we thank you so much for being with us today and really talking about this important issue as um, as relates to turnover, um, you know, whether it be during this COVID-19 crisis um, and frankly beyond. So um, no questions so far. Um, if there's any that could have come in, I'll direct them to you guys afterwards. But we want to thank everyone for joining us today and for diving into the first of our three-part series into web, uh, excuse me, into turnover here at the Star Center. So thank you guys so much. Thank you to our presenters and thank you for everyone for being a part of us uh, being with us today and we will talk to you next week thank you everyone thank you thank you suzanne thank you everyone have a great rest of your day bye bye bye, -bye.